Welcome to the African American Heritage House and the 2020 CHQ Assembly. My name is Errol Davis. I have the distinct honor and pleasure of serving as the chairman of the board of the African American Heritage House here at Chautauqua, or AAHH, as we fondly uh, refer to it. Uh, it is my privilege to welcome you to this sixth of seven programs that the AAH will present uh, during this summer's assembly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the AAHH is a diverse organization which is informed uh, by the African American experience. We are committed uh, to strengthening Chautauqua and we do that by encouraging and welcoming diversity, by fostering honest conversations such as the new online mirror project and also by adding new voices to the programmatic mix something that we did with great vigor uh, in 2019 and something that we continue to do during this 2020 season. Today, more than ever, it is important that we own and understand both our past as well as our present. Uh, the AAHH is committed to telling the stories that you seldom hear about, but that need to be told. Uh, I encourage all of our viewers to visit our website, aaheritagehouse.org, uh, to learn how you can become involved in our activity. As we are entirely supported uh, by contributions, I want to thank our many friends and supporters for making both last season and this season possible. In particular, I want to thank the Union Pacific Corporation for its underwriting, which is assuring that the voices of the marginalized and the underserved are being heard both clearly and loudly uh, this season. Without the generosity of our friends and supporters, we would be unable to bring the quality speakers to Chautauqua that we have over the years and are doing so again uh, this season. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for your continuing support. Uh, as you might expect, uh, in this job, I have lots of discussions on social justice issues with my friends and colleagues. Uh, most are gaining an understanding of the historical injustices suffered by African Americans. Um, most, if not all, say that black lives matter, and all seem to believe that we need to do something. Uh, but when I mention reparations, however, I start to get some clear differences of opinion. Uh, our speakers today are William A. Darity Jr. and Kirsten Mullen, the co-authors of the, should I say hot, uh, new book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century uh, that came out in April of this year and it's published by the University of North Carolina Press. Uh, professor Darity is the Samuel Du Bois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and American African and African American Studies and Economics, as well as the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. He has served as chair of the Department of African and African American Studies and was the founding director of the Research Network on Racial and Ethnic Inequality at Duke. Professor Darity's research focus is quite broad. He focuses on inequality by race, class and ethnicity, stratification economics, schooling and the racial achievement gap, north-south theories of trade and development, skin shade and labor market outcomes, the economics of reparations, the Atlantic slave trade and the industrial revolution, the history of economics, and the social psycho psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. Ms. Mullins is a folklorist and the founder of Artifactual, an arts consulting practice, and Carolina Circuit Writers, a literary consortium that brings expressive writers, writers of color to the Carolinas. She was a member of the Freelon Ajay Bond concept development team that was awarded the Smithsonian Institution's Commission to design the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which I hope many of you have either visited or will visit in the very near future. Under the auspices of the North Carolina Arts Council, she worked to expand the Coastal Folklife Survey. As a faculty member with the Community Folklife Documentation Institute, she trained students to research and record the state's African-American music heritage. Ms. Mullen was a consultant on the North Carolina Museum's history, history 
North Carolina Museum of History's North Carolina Legends, as well as its civil rights exhibition projects. Her writing in museum catalogs, journals, and in commercial media includes Black Culture and History, and History Matter from the American Prospect, which examines the politics of funding Black cultural institutions. I am really honored and excited by their presence here today, and I know that you're going to find their remarks both stimulating and enlightening. However, uh, before we begin today's lecture, our live audience should know that you may submit questions uh, for our live Q&A with Professor Darity and Ms. Mullen uh, through the submission portal at questions.chq.org, which is shown on your screen. You can do that from any uh, mobile or desktop browser. Or if you want to use Twitter, use the hashtag CHQ2020. Uh, unlike our previous programs on the platform, today's program will be entirely live and will consist of a discussion uh, with Ms. Mullen and Dr. Darity, followed by the live Q&A based upon questions submitted by our live audience in and around the world. Uh, tuning in around the world, uh, my understanding is that we now have participants from 55 countries uh, online. My fellow Chautauquans, the AAHH is pleased to introduce you to Ms. Kirsten Mullen and Dr. William Darity Jr. Welcome, and thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion, but uh, since I already mentioned your book, let's just jump right into it. Uh, it came out in April of this year. Why did you write it? Why did you write the book? So um, I was born into a family that um, you know, practiced civil rights activism. Uh, my, my, paternal, my, my maternal grandfather, a uh, pastor, was a staunch NAACP supporter. Um, the Ku Klux Klan burned a cross on my mother's undergraduate college, Talladega, when she was a student there. Wow. Um, and my mother took my sister and me to our first march after the murders in March in August 1965 of two freedom fighters, Viola Liuzzo and Episcopal priest Jonathan Myrick Daniels. Um, you know, I think, you know, when I think back on it, um, one of my earliest publications was an article about the black presence in the built environment. And, you know, I was trying to understand why the country's historic sites, which were built by enslaved people, many of them, you know, were not uh, considered black landmarks. You know, it's like black people were kind of written out of the whole historic preservation movement initially. It's just a really yeah. odd, kind of an odd circumstance. Um, and then I think I probably wrote uh, formally uh, for the first time on reparations in about 2005. Yeah. yeah, I come from a family that is similar with respect to engagement in the civil rights movement. My mother used to take my sister and me with her on marches that took place uh, in the Triangle area. Uh, centered primarily on Chapel Hill, uh, but she also took us to Raleigh and Durham for, for demonstrations that took place. Uh, but my story of coming to working on reparations and working on this book with Kirsten may be a little bit different. Uh, about 30 years ago, I would count myself as a reparation skeptic, like many people that we encounter today. Not because I thought there was something wrong with reparations from a principled standpoint, but because I thought it was unrealistic to expect it ever to take place. And I was asked to write the introduction to a volume that's called The Wealth of Races by a friend of mine, uh, Richard America, who is also an economist. And uh, Richard America uh, urged me to write the introduction to this volume, which was a collection of articles about uh, economists developing estimates of how much a reparations bill would actually cost. Uh, and I told Richard that uh, I, I wasn't inclined to do this because I didn't think it would ever happen. And there wasn't much point in actually uh, exploring these papers. And, and Richard said, write whatever you please, even if it's wholly negative, I want you to write the introduction. And so I started reading the papers, and the, the deeper I got into it, the more convinced I became that uh, reparations was the way that this nation had to go to address its history of, uh, of, of oppression of, of, of black Americans. And I concluded that even if the odds were extremely long, 
this is something that needed to be uh, needed to be uh, undertaken. And so uh, from that point on, I decided that I would make a commitment to do my research and to be a political advocate for reparations. And when the opportunity came to write the book, uh, when we were invited by one of the editors at the University of North Carolina Press, immediately asked Kirsten if she would work with me uh, because I, I was fairly convinced that the two of us working in conjunction with our separate or distinct skill sets could produce a really, really good book. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, as I mentioned in the intro, when I speak to some of my friends about social justice, uh, we seem to be perfectly aligned until we get to the issue uh, of reparations. And I think part of the challenge is defining what is uh, reparations. And so uh, it seems to mean so many things to so many uh, different people. Uh, and so uh, could you give us your definition, your working definition of reparations that will come out of the book? We open the book by saying that uh, reparations is a program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure for a grievous injustice. And uh, we offer that as a general definition of reparations, but of course the book is specifically addressed to reparations for black American descendants of slavery in the United States. And so uh, as a consequence, we think of acknowledgement as constituting an apology and also a recognition on the part of the culpable party that they benefited from the grievous injustice. Uh, redress is restitution, which customarily takes the form of monetary payments. It has, in the case of uh, the U.S. government's uh, restitution for Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated in World War II. It took that form with respect to the German government's monetary payments to uh, victims of the Holocaust. It also took that form with respect to the U.S. government's payments that were made to families who lost loved ones in the 911 attacks. And so similarly, uh, we take the position that uh, restitution for black Americans for the historic injustices that took place in the United States should be monetary in form, direct payments to eligible recipients. And then uh, the third dimension of this process is what we refer to as closure, which is essentially a settling of accounts, a, a recognition on the part of both the culpable party and the victimized community that the debt has been paid. Now, uh, in the context of thinking about reparations in the United States for black American descendants of U.S. slavery, we want to make it clear that we think that the case is anchored on more than slavery alone. Okay. Uh, and slavery alone is, is the deep horror, but there's much more that has occurred in the aftermath of slavery. And so we say the following, and from here to equality, uh, we say, we draw a thick line from the nation's origins to the present. The case we build is based on all three tiers or phases of injustice, slavery, American apartheid or Jim Crow, and the combined effects of present day discrimination and the ongoing deprecation of black lives. Most advocates of black reparations have focused exclusively on the injustice of slavery as the basis for redress. Law professor Boris Bitker argued that the case for black reparations should center solely on the harms of legalized segregation, while Roy L. Brooks, also a legal scholar, has argued that the foundation for black reparations is the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. We submit that the Bill of Particulars for Black Reparations also must include contemporary ongoing injustices, injustices resulting in barriers and penalties for the black descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Um, we go on to say, sociologist Joe Fagan catalogs the continuing injuries inflicted on black Americans, including wage penalties, physical and psycho-emotional health wounds, and community and institutional damages. Despite the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, a wave of federal legislation in the 1960s and 1970s intended to eliminate legal apartheid in the United States and the enactment of anti-discrimination laws, blacks continue to bear the weight of American racism. That burden is manifest in labor market discrimination, grossly attenuated wealth, 
confinement to neighborhoods with lower levels of amenities and safety, disproportionate exposure to inter inferior schooling, significantly greater danger in encounters with the police and the criminal justice system writ large, and a general social disdain for the value of black people's lives. The legal apparatus created by the civil rights revolution does little to address the complex web of harms imposed upon black Americans today. Taken individually, any one of these three tiers of injustice, slavery, the regime of legal segregation and subordination, and current discrimination, makes a powerful case for black reparations. Taken collectively, they are impossible to ignore. Uh, thank you uh, for that. If Let me go back to the uh, Civil Rights Act uh, of the mid-60s. And as I look at the composition of the quote-unquote black uh, population in the United States, uh, it grew from about 1% uh, in the 1960s to about 10% today, uh, and many of whom are also facing uh, obstacles that uh, native-born uh, African-Americans uh, face. But you limit your case to reparations uh, to black American descendants uh, of slavery. Uh, why do you do that? Well, I think the first reason is that um, we are concerned about the descendants of the enslaved folks who, upon emancipation, were denied the promised 40 acres land grants that were supposed to be restitution. And, uh, and I'd like to share a portion of our book in which we talk about those, uh, uh, talk about the incident that's involved with the, the failure to provide those 40 acres. Um, we say the following, uh, General Sherman's plan had begun to take shape in January 1865, three months before the final battle of the Civil War was fought when he and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton met in Savannah, Georgia, with 20 black leaders, ministers and church officers primarily, to discuss the plight of the state's freedmen. The leaders selected former slave and Granville County, North Carolina native, Reverend Garrison Frazier, 67 years of age and a minister for 35 years to be their spokesperson. He had managed to purchase his and his wife's freedom eight years earlier with $1,000 in silver and gold. Uh, when asked how the freedmen proposed to provide a livelihood for themselves, Reverend Fraser responded, the way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. That is by the labor of the women and children and old men, and we can soon maintain ourselves and have something to spare. And to assist the government, the young men should enlist in the service of the government and serve in such manner as they may be wanted. We want to be placed on land until we are able to buy it and make it our own. When asked if he preferred to live among whites or solely among blacks, Reverend Fraser indicated that while he could not speak for the other ministers, he preferred to live among blacks, for there is a prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over. The day after that meeting, Sherman issued Special Orders Number 15 with the provision of 40 acres of land for the formerly enslaved in a territory that stretched from the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Charleston south to North Florida. This was a ter territory of approximately 5.3 million acres. The overall plan was to provide the formerly enslaved with at least 40 million acres of land. But out of the 5.3 million acres that were initially designated by Sherman, only 40,000 formerly enslaved persons were settled on 400,000 acres. And even that was taken away from them by President Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, uh, who we sometimes refer to as the worst president that the United States ever had. He reversed the plan of land restitution and restored the land to the former slaveholders. And that is the beginning, from our perspective, of the current racial wealth gap which amounts to, on average, uh, of approximately $800,000 in net worth between a black and a white household. The, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, the, uh, about, at the same time, yeah. 
um, you know, whites, at the same time that the newly emancipated slaves were, um, you know, were not given uh, the 40 acres that they had been promised, 40 acre land grants, white Americans, through the Homestead Act of 1862, were in fact granted 160 acre land plots. Um, and so these were, you know, land grants basically that were made available to Americans who, uh, who could affirm that they had not raised a hand against the U.S. Uh, government during the war, um, that they were, um, you know, willing to either uh, live on the land for at least six months and then pay the federal government uh, $1.25 per acre, or they would live on the land at least five years um, but, you know, put a house on the property, you know, in some ways make improvements. Um, so we know from the research of Trina Williams that we're talking about 287 million acres of land that was appropriated for these white settlers uh, in the Western territories. So to give, you know, uh, the Chautauqua community some idea of what 287 million, million acres looks like, that would be a land mass that encompassed all of Washington state all of Oregon, all of California, Nevada, and Massachusetts combined, combined, or put differently, all of California and all of Texas combined. Um, so we know that uh, today, um, some you know, you know, on average, 46 million white Americans are still reaping the benefits of that land trust. So you're talking about land that people could farm out, right? Uh, land that they could have leased. You could subdivide part of it. Um, you could borrow against it. Uh, but importantly, you could pass that asset down through your family. And so, you know, this intergenerational transfer of wealth that whites were provided was not something that was available to black Americans at that time or at any time, to be honest. Uh, you know, uh, any largesse from the U.S. government. So, you know, white wealth you know, 160 acre land grants, you know, for whites and, you know, blacks being denied even the 40 acre land grants that they were promised. So we know that wealth captures the cumulative intergenerational effects of white supremacy. I mean, these are the transfers of resources across generations. And that is the basis of the wealth that whites have today. And that's also the basis of this gap, this huge gulf that, that we see in black-white wealth. And it's that historical process that is unique to the experience of black American yeah. descendants of U.S. slavery yeah. and is not applicable to more recent immigrants who definitely have a, a case for uh, for for uh, being exposed to a variety of harms in the United States, particularly at the hands of the police. But that has to be addressed through the legal apparatus that we have in the United States. It is not something that's appropriately addressed by a program of reparations. Great. I, I appreciate that answer. And uh, this has been a great learning experience for us all because uh, we've continued to uh, investigate the black-white uh, uh, excuse me, wealth gap uh, in the United States. We heard the impacts of the GI Bill uh, with George McCarthy uh, last week. We talked about land policies uh, in the early 30s, and now we're going all the way back to post-Civil uh, War, where one group was promised 40 acres, and then it was taken away from them, and another group was given 160 acres, and that remains a basis for wealth going forward uh, today. But now how do I prove I'm a descendant of a slave? So we, um, for us, there are two criteria, basically. There is, uh, there's both a lineage standard and an identity standard. So you're talking about, in the case uh, for the lineage standard, eligible recipients would be American citizens who can prove that they have one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. Um, so, you know, we know that, you know, uh, enslaved people were not named in the census. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if your ancestor appears in 1870 uh, and they were, you know, more than 10 years old, but didn't appear, you know, by name uh, in 1860, they were likely enslaved, right? And so, um, you know, we think it would be prudent for um, the Reparations com uh, Commission to set up uh, an agency that would include, you know, genealogists who would assist 
uh, you know, uh, black American descendants of slavery in, you know, in, in learning more about their family's history and kind of, you know, uh, you know, doing that research uh, on their behalf. But the other piece is an identity standard. And uh, so for at least 12 years prior to the onset of a reparations program or the passage of legislation enacting a study commission for reparations, whichever came first, these individuals would need to have self-identified as black, African-American, or Negro, right? And you know this could be ascertained from a driver's license. Uh, perhaps they would be willing to share, um, you know, the tick box on their census records. Um, you know, but but these are the two standards that we think um, you know need to be applied for uh, eligibility. Yeah, you mentioned um, uh, both of you now a, a commission to study and develop proposals uh, for reparations. There is legislation pending uh, in the Congress. Uh, for that very point, uh, do you believe that this represents an important step in the road back, back to uh, black reparations? And also from a doability perspective in an election year, why are we hearing so little about it? Uh, you know, if black lives do matter, why don't we hear Democrats talking about uh, reparations? Do you believe that this issue is so hot that it will backfire uh, on them? And, should we be working to promote the passage of that legislation to establish that commission? So I want to say going to speak a bit on HR 40 itself, but I want to say, you know, when the in the early stages of this campaign, this presidential campaign, we were hearing about reparations. <laughs> uh, Marianne Williamson was the first to advocate reparations. Uh, she even talked about, you know, uh, direct payments and uh, had established an albeit low uh, but she had, uh, you know, uh, she had uh, determined a dollar amount uh, where reparations should start. And then Julian Castro and Tom Steyer also talked about some form of reparations program. And they were also concerned about, you know, the, the wealth gap. Um, there has been, you know, there have been all, any number of events that have shifted the conversation. I would say COVID-19 being the first uh, to do so. But you know, COVID uh, only further dramatized, you know, the case for reparations. You've had, you know, excess black mortality. We've had the collapse of black businesses and black employment. So, you know, it was and is an urgent time to adopt reparations. Um, it's been urgent for 155 years since the end of American slavery. Um, and it's time for the nation to pay the debt. You know, it's time for racial justice. But we want to speak specifically, though, to H.R. 40, to some of the shortcomings uh, of that legislation. So l let me say first that um, a prelude to a reparations plan uh, usually does have to be some form of a commission that generates a report that provides uh, a legislative roadmap for Congress to follow to establish such a, uh, such a plan of action. Uh, in advance of the reparations payments that were made to Japanese Americans for their unjust incarceration during World War II, there was a commission on wartime relocation and internment of civilians that generated a report that did two things. First, it, um, it established that American official knew that Japanese Americans were not a national security threat, but they still placed people in internment camps all across the country. And secondly, it provided uh, a, 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 a program of restitution for, uh, for, for the Japanese Americans who had been victimized by this, uh, this process during the course of World War II. And so similarly, one could argue that you need a parallel commission as a prelude to a reparations program for uh, black American descendants of US slavery. Unfortunately, the existing legislation is not satisfactory and it has the potential of actually yielding a commission report that will not produce the type of reparations plan that is really needed to address the nation's moral crisis. Uh, and so uh, uh, last year, the Senate, uh, I'm sorry, the House Judiciary Committee held hearings on H.R. 40. Uh, they were held on Juneteenth. 
and uh, and I was one of the contributors to the testimony for that hearing. I wasn't there in person, but I submitted written testimony that went into the record. And I think what was unique about the testimony that I offered is that I think I was the only person who actually talked about the content of the bill itself, whereas all of the other uh, individuals who, who provided testimony talked about you know, yay or nay on reparations. Uh, but I, I was very concerned about what the text of the bill actually said and what it would accomplish. And so let me indicate uh, somewhat quickly what the bill ought to do that is not specified in its current form. Um, first of all, the bill uh, involves establishing a commission that now consists of 13 people it originally consisted of seven, and, uh, and we would like to see the original number of seven restored. We think that the 13 produces a superfluous number of members for the commission. Uh, the bill does not provide for all the commissioners to be appointed by Congress. Three of them would be appointed by the President of the United States, but it's a congressional commission, so we think that all of the members of the commission should be appointed by Congress. The commission should have a paid professional staff, uh, but while commissioners' reasonable expenses should be reimbursed, neither they nor any organization to which they belong should have a salary, an honorarium, or the equivalent for this vital national service. In the present form of the bill, commissioners would receive salaries at the GS-18 level which is approximately $200,000. It's above, it's above the normal civil service standard. Uh, the commission must complete its final report, inclusive of a detailed prescription for legislation to enact reparations within 18 months of its impaneling. Uh, there is no date of closure for the commission in the present form of the legislation. And then the commissioners must be charged to uh, purposefully design legislation for reparations that fulfills at least three objectives. First, the legislation must designate black American descendants of U.S. slavery as eligible recipients. Second, it must target elimination of the gulf in black and white wealth. This would amount to a federal expenditure of anywhere between 10 to $12 trillion at the minimum side. And this would prioritize, and then the, the bill must prioritize reliance on direct payments to eligible recipients. So from our perspective, the commission has a sacred mission, uh, a mission that has, has, has remained unfulfilled for 155 years, and we do not want to see that mission jeopardized by an inadequate piece of legislation. Thank you for that. Um, let me remind uh, our viewers uh, at this point that they can submit questions uh, on the, uh, the platform uh, and for live Q&A and questions.chq.org uh, and we're going to be getting to those uh, in a few moments. Uh, but let me uh, step back and ask, you know, is a, you were skeptical, you said, uh, when you were asked to write uh, an intro uh, and you didn't think it was politically uh, feasible. Uh, and as I look at the examples that you gave, whether uh, it was uh, Japanese in internment camps in the United States, whether it was victims or, uh, of 9-11, uh, or even the Holocaust, when I, and I won't define that as the thousands of years in which Jews have been persecuted, but a narrow period uh, under the Nazi regime. Uh, these were narrower historical periods which were uh, supposedly understandable and sold to people. You know, I can talk about internment as a matter of years and 9-11 uh, and as a matter of weeks uh, per se. Uh, and the Holocaust is a matter of uh, a decade or so. Uh, but now we're talking about slaves freed 200 uh, years ago uh, or more. Uh, and well, what do I have to years ago. Yeah. And why, you know, what kind of education do I have to do 
to make the average person accept that reparations are appropriate. I think that's part of the challenge uh, that you do have, uh, and particularly uh, with the broad number of Americans who are, uh, you know, came to this country long after slavery uh, was abolished, uh, and they would be paying uh, this as well. There's a challenge here. How do you meet that challenge? Just one, one part of that, and then I know Sandy will definitely have some things to contribute. Um, well, let me speak to the last part that you, you mentioned okay. first. And this was this question of, you know, folks who came to the U.S. Uh, more recently, mm -hmm. you know, what is their obligation? And so I think first you, you know, we, we, of course, we distinguish between voluntary and involuntary, you know, immigration. So one might, you know, in, uh, imagine, uh, you know, voluntary immigrants being attracted to America's infrastructure, to its landscape, to its economic development, all of which was built on the backs of, you know, forced, you know, black labor over nearly, you know, um, you know, 300 years and another 155 years of low wages for blacks compared to those of whites. So when you when you migrate to a country, you migrate to its history and to its obligations. Uh, so presumably individuals, you know, considering migrating uh, to the U.S. conducted research on their potential destination. You know, America's racist history uh, and present are well known. So, um, you know, plus these post-civil rights era immigrants, you know, from the Africa diaspora, you know, as Sandy mentioned earlier, you know, did not suffer U.S. slavery. Um, their ancestors were not denied the promise of 40 acre land grants. Um, nor were they present during the nearly 100 years of segregation or Jim Crow and white terror campaigns. So, you know, these individuals may indeed, you know, uh, be experiencing, you know, these black individuals may indeed be experiencing discrimination, but they have not had the long history of discrimination in the U.S. as have black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Um, but because they have come here voluntarily, they too are part of the obligations that uh, the United States government has. And that should be part of their, you know, um, that should be part of their embodiment, I, I believe. Um, their sense of moral their obligation. Their sense of moral obligations. Like, yeah. you know, you, you know you, if you come to a racist country and then eventually you too are treated in a racist manner, there's something odd about you saying, well, now I should become, I should receive reparations because I'm being mistreated. Um, you know, that was something one, you know, why didn't you go to Canada? You know, that is something that you might have anticipated, I think. Um, or maybe you came with the idea that you were going to support black Americans. I mean, we, we have wondered, you know, what, you know, in the case of the Jews and the Holocaust, um, you know, they benefited greatly from the advocacy of David Ben-Gurion, who was uh, the, the very active, very, um, you know, influential uh, leader of Israel. Uh, well, well, black Americans don't have a country, let alone a continent, that is advocating on their behalf. But would that, you know, the African Union would say, we support reparations for black Americans, uh, or and maybe even extend that to say, and we will not allow you know, additional American corporations to, um, you know, to come and do business with us until they, you know, uh, put in place, you know, until they push Congress to uh, enact a national reparations program. Yeah, but let me talk a bit about uh, white immigrants to the United mm -hmm. States who profess to not have any connection to slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, so we say the following in, in our book, all those who subsequently migrated to the United States have moved to a country whose contemporary promise of opportunity is anchored in its history of exploitation of black lives. The slave trade and slavery extended their tendrils into every fissure of the American economy, producing a hothouse effect that created vast national wealth. America's economic success was built by the unrelenting enslavement of black people. One can hypothesize a counterfactual chain of events where American economic growth took place without slavery, but this is the actual way in which it all began. But let me add, we said at the outset that we are 
making a case for reparations for black American descendants of U.S. slavery that's not predicated exclusively on slavery. We place a heavy, heavy weight on nearly 100 years of legal apartheid in the United States. And many, many individuals who immigrated to the United States who, who, are, who are identified as being white uh, came during the period after the Civil War and between the 1960s, when legal segregation finally uh, finally came to an end, uh, not necessarily de facto segregation, but certainly legal segregation, um, and and uh, and those immigrants benefited heavily from the fact that there were significant policy advantages put in place on behalf of whites. Uh, you mentioned uh, George McCarthy meeting with you all on the last episode, and I think he focused heavily on housing policy in the United States during the 20th century, where you had uh, restrictive covenants, you had predatory uh, lending associated with the housing process, particularly by a redlining. And you had the discriminatory application of the GI Bill, uh, so it becomes it becomes a little bit difficult to begin to identify living white Americans who have no connection to the advantages that were associated with American public policy for home buying in the 20th century or for land acquisition in the 19th century. So uh, yes, people may not have been slaveholders but they are potential beneficiaries of the way in which race has operated in the United States throughout it, the full trajectory of, of, of our country's history. Yeah, and another point to make about that too, you know, just because the debt is large, doesn't mean it should, and, and it has been existed for a long time, doesn't mean it shouldn't be paid. Yeah. You know, I don't know of any country where you can say, oh, I owe you too much money to pay you back. I'm gonna continue to, you know, borrow more money from you because we've all agreed that I can never pay it back. That, I don't know any place where, where that is an argument that would fly. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I hear what you're saying. I, I certainly take no exception to it. One of the challenges I continue uh, to see, however, uh, particularly as we run uh, the speaker series last year and this year, uh, is that everything's coming as a revelation. Uh, to people, oh, I didn't know the GI Bill uh, did this. Oh, I didn't know that there were uh, housing policies to, that to take us out of the depression that that exacerbated the wealth gap. Uh, I didn't know what happened to the 40 acres uh, and the mule. Uh, and my sense is that until the body politic knows that, appreciates it, and owns it, uh, will they ever pay reparations for it? Uh, we don't know. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, the one reason we, we, we don't know is because in the case of German reparations payments to uh, the victims of the Holocaust, there was significant opposition in Germany. It was a very small minority of Germans who were actually in favor of the reparations program. Uh, and so it happened despite the fact that uh, there, there was not uh, a, a popular consensus on behalf of the reparations project. So I'm, I'm not sure, I don't, don't think it could happen that way in the United States, but I don't know. But there is evidence that the, the needle has moved significantly in terms of popular attitudes about reparations. Uh, in in uh, the year 2000, when uh, a couple of researchers at the University of Chicago Ravana Popoff and Michael Dawson did a survey of American attitudes about reparations. Only 4% of white Americans indicated that they were in favor of reparations for African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago, a, a, a similar survey was conducted and the percentage was 15%. Uh, that's still low, but that's a lot better than 4%. Yeah, it's moving in the right direction. Uh, yeah, and, and then there is a new survey, and we're, we're, we're not completely confident about its accuracy, but there's a new survey that was taken in the aftermath of COVID-19 and the tragic visible murder of George Floyd which indicates that 39% of white wow. Americans say that they are in favor of reparations for black Americans. So, uh, so I, I, I think, you know, something that I, in 1989, where I thought that this was something that was deeply, deeply infeasible, 
uh, it looks like that we're in a very different moment now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and whether or not we can address people's misconceptions, both about the nation's history with respect to slavery, the Civil War, and the Reconstruction Era, and whether we can address their misconceptions about why we have racial inequality in the United States at all is, is an open question. But that's one of the tasks that we are attempting to pursue in the pages of From Here to Equality, is to, is to overturn false narratives and misconceptions that stand as obstacles to a reparations project. I mean, it is striking that in the moment that uh, restitution was being negotiated for uh, for victims of the Holocaust, uh, the the percentage of people who supported that movement never was higher than twenty one percent. Well, well, there is hope then. Uh, <laughs> let me. I have lots of questions. Uh, I think it's unfair for me to just keep hogging them. Oh, so let me turn to some that are coming in uh, from the audience, uh, and I will uh, uh, attempt to try and read them legibly uh, here. Uh, what do you n understand of the current Democratic presidential nominee and his running mate concerning their support uh, for reparations? And this should be interesting if, if you know anything of Kamala Harris's, because according to your definition, she is not eligible. That's right. As, as far as we know, she would not be eligible yeah. to, uh, to receive reparations. I mean, if, she, if she has enslaved ancestors, they were in Jamaica. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, that would not be relevant. Uh, which is not to say that uh, she might not have a claim for reparations. Uh, it would be a claim that would be made by Jamaica but, toward the United UK. Kingdom. Yeah. It's not a claim that would be made on the U.S. government. And, and that process is already underway via CARICOM's Reparations Commission uh, that is seeking restitution on behalf of the, uh, of, the, of, the, peoples of, the of, of the peoples of the Caribbean. Oh. So, and, and the French Caribbean is, uh, you know, Haiti, for example, uh, is, is, uh, is part of that project seeking reparations from France, which they should have gotten a long time ago. Uh, and in fact, Haiti ended up paying reparations to, to France, France yeah. which is, is beyond outrageous. Uh, so Haiti needs to get that money back with interest plus more. So, uh, but, but uh, yes, you're correct. Uh, Kamala Harris would not be eligible under the, under the program that we have in mind. Our understanding is that she has endorsed H.R. 40. Uh, but she's endorsed it on the Senate side, where it's S-1083. Uh, but S-1083 is actually an identical piece of legislation as H.R. 40, and so all of the concerns that we've raised about the content of H.R. 40 are they applicable here. They still apply. Uh, I know of, I don't believe either Kamala Harris or, or um, or Joe Biden have explicitly endorsed reparations in and of itself. The last comment that we heard from Joe Biden was something about he might consider it if it included Native, Native Americans. Americans. Uh, and uh, you know, we certainly think that there's a, a, a reparations case that can be made by Native Americans. It's not the case that we've been working on. But we want to emphasize that when we start talking about Native American reparations and Black American reparations, there's a conceptual difference in terms of what the objectives are. Uh, Native American reparations are aimed at the target of achieving greater sovereignty. But Black American reparations are aimed at providing the material basis for full citizenship. And these are very, very different kinds of objectives or targets. And so we should not collapse these reparations cases on one another. Uh, I was just about to surrender the floor until that last uh, point you made. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you want to achieve beyond monetary uh, or wealth, the closing of the wealth gap. What will be achieved in reparations? So we, we don't want to de-emphasize the importance no. of monetary payments. Um, 
you know, for both substantive and symbolic reasons, we think this, these are really essential. But we certainly would not object to uh, some of those funds being directed potentially to uh, historically black colleges and universities, for example. Um, one might uh, create you know, a, a source of funds for business development. You might, you might have a community-wide group of advisors who uh, reviewed proposals and provided technical assistance you know, to, um, you know, to business owners. But the idea is that if you had these direct payments that individuals could decide on their own uh, how they wanted to invest those funds, and, and importantly, uh, if they chose to do so, could pass them on to their offspring. Yeah. yeah. I have a, uh, a very interesting question, and uh, my sense is that, uh, and I certainly should not get into the minds of uh, questioners, but I will provide a little context. Uh, there was a movement or, uh, to rename the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, mm -hmm. after John Lewis. Uh, that movement uh, was occasioned by some resistance from the people of Alabama, in, of the black people uh, in Alabama, uh, because they, for a variety of reasons, one of which they weren't consulted uh, about it, and the second was that uh, they wanted it to, to be a living memorial of their blood, sweat, uh, and tears. So they had their reasons, but the media, of course, emphasized it was black people objecting to the bridge being named after John Lewis. And so this question says, do you encounter any discomfort with the idea from, repar from reparations, from members of the communities a reparations program would benefit? If so, what are their concerns? So you're asking if there are black people who, who oppose or Yeah, well, yeah, yeah I, I assume that's what it means. Okay. I'm, I'm okay, yes. Yeah. So yes, there are, there are indeed black people who uh, object to reparations. Some of them, uh, some of the, so the, some of the uh, critiques we have heard um, you know, there's no amount of money that could compensate for the pain and suffering of our ancestors. Um, even though, you know, this is the way the courts all around the world, um, you know, deal with harms. Uh, you know, we put adopt. We have all kinds of people in the field of forensic economics whose job it is to, you know, to figure out the value of these lives or property, and to make a payments uh, available when these cases are won. Um, we also, uh, in the book, we actually uh, have a section where we we quote Frederick Douglass, yes. who says exactly that, that there's no sum of money that could meet the harms that have been imposed on black folks under the period of slavery, because he's he's talking during the emancipation, the period of emancipation. But but he says <laughs> it doesn't mean you shouldn't, shouldn't try. Exactly. Uh, and 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 he argues quite forcefully at that point that there should have at least been the uh, the restitution that took the form uh, of land allocations. I think I think exactly. it's what about thirty percent of Black Americans do not support oh. reparations. Yeah. And and one of the arguments that we've also heard is it imposes some sort of victimization, victimization. psychology right. on folks to accept reparations. And, and our position is, well, if an individual black person feels like they will have a victimized psychology, then don't, then them. don't take the money. We won't force yeah. you uh, yeah. to, to receive the reparations payments. Um, another question, uh, does your preferred reparations program factor in disparities in experience with the criminal justice system? in terms of arrest rate, bail, prison terms, wrongful convictions, et cetera? Only insofar as that has an effect on the racial wealth differential, because that's the target or the metric that we use uh, for that purpose. Uh, there's this, this, this amazing quotation that we reproduce in the book from Malcolm X, where he talks about a circumstance in which somebody has had a knife plunged into their back nine inches. And he talks about it being pulled out six inches, and that's not sufficient. And he says it's pulled out all the way, and he says that's not sufficient. Uh, that that's a matter of uh, that that what needs to be done is that the wound needs to be healed. And so we think that projects like those that would stop anti-black police violence are a matter of pulling the knife out 
but they're not a matter of healing the wound in the sense of providing compensation for the effects of anti-black police violence or the effects of mass incarceration. And we try to capture those effects in our analysis in terms of looking at the racial wealth gap as the uh, as as the uh, the objective that has to uh, the that the well, racial wealth gap has to be closed as the objective of a reparations program, but we certainly are strongly in favor of any steps to take the knife out. Right. Uh, by all means, right. uh, we just don't consider right. that to be reparations. Yeah, so these are essential steps, but they're not sufficient. Yeah. You know, so we are you know hoping that you know both individuals but also communities will take a both and position. Yeah, there are certainly people uh, of goodwill uh, that respect this issue and are at loss for what to do. Uh, when we talk about uh, improving race relations, uh, for example, you know, they're given some concrete steps, you know, uh, listening circles, reading history, uh, et cetera. Uh, but the question here is, uh, I happen to know that my maternal family line were slave owners. What do you suggest I do, that I directly do? Well, we would, we would uh, ask this individual to, um, to lobby and petition Congress for a national program of reparations, um, but also to look at the formal and informal associations that they have, uh, not just your family, but your workspace, uh, but also perhaps your community of faith, uh, your sorority, fraternity, um, you know, your Frisbee, ultimate Frisbee group. Um, you know, all of these groups uh, have business that they conduct on a regular basis. And so the question is, you know, this is a moment when you can uh, get your own house in order. Uh, so this is a time to look and see who are the thought leaders that you all consult when you have questions. Um, when uh, a hire is in the offing, who gets the job? Uh, if there are contracts to be let, who are the vendors that you seek? Um, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we can. Well, I mean, who are the members? Who are the members of the group you, that, 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 that you're involved with? That you're involved yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we can, you know, put the microscope on our own uh, houses and make progress. But while doing so, also advocate for a program of reparations. So in the city that we live, Durham, North Carolina, the city council passed a resolution advocating for a national program of reparations. Um, that is something that any city could do. It's something that any corporation, any nonprofit uh, could do. Any individual, any family could do so and send those resolutions to Congress. Make your voices known. We, uh, I want to emphasize that we don't think of this as a matter of individual or personal guilt. We think of this as a matter of national obligation and responsibility for a debt that was not paid 155 years ago. And so we don't expect individuals to necessarily reach, I mean, if they want to do this, fine, but, but we don't think that a reparations project should be built around individuals reaching into their own pockets and pulling out money. We think that a reparations project has to be built around the federal government financing a program to eliminate racial wealth differences in the United States. I've got a couple of questions here uh, and they relate to methodologies of, of calculations and the factors uh, that were within the, uh, the, your uh, estimates of, of what it would cost. Uh, one is, how do you factor in the unmeasurable? Is there any accounting for centuries of emotional anguish? Well, not in our analysis. Not in our, not in our analysis, not no. Not in our analysis. So that, that's, that's also why I think we said the 10 to $12 trillion figure could be viewed as the, as, 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 as the low end. Uh, but we're not at all certain how you go about doing that. We think individuals should receive the resources, and if they are burdened by intergenerational trauma or other types of psychological problems, then they can make the decision to use some of their funds for the purposes of getting therapy. But it's not a focus of our, our analysis at all. Of course, if you were a plaintiff's attorney, this would be uh, the actual damages that you're talking about as opposed to pain and suffering. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's true. That's right. 
How would the wealth gap payment be calculated? How would it be distributed? Lump sum, installments, et cetera? So, you know, it, it could be, you know, a combination of all of those things. Um, you know, there's, you know, been concern about, you know, whether or not the, the payments, uh, whether or not the restitution should be so liquid. You know, if the goal is to build assets, uh, perhaps part of maybe even a significant portion of the payments need to be in some kind of instrument that cannot so quickly be converted to cash. So perhaps it's a trust uh, or it might be, you know, stocks. Uh, but, but, you know, they're, 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 or you could sequence the payments over a period of years, for example, uh, or perhaps, um, you know, individuals, uh, could only use the interest off of, uh, the principal, for example. So there are a number of ways that one could look at that. So that's not solely, you know, one huge check, you know, per household. Yeah. But we, we start with the fact that, um, uh, Black American descendants of U.S. slavery are about 13% of the nation's population, but possess only about 2.5% uh, of the nation's wealth. And so the foundation for our estimate of the size of a reparations bill is, is, is based upon what would be required to bring the black share of the nation's wealth into proportion with the black share of the nation's population, at minimum. And so that's how we come up with the 10 to $12 trillion figure. And it would be allocated across all eligible black Americans. And so we estimate that this would amount somewhere in the vicinity of 250 to $300,000 per eligible recipient. And we argue in From Here to Equality, as Kirsten mentioned, that there are multiple ways in which you could do that, uh, but, the, but the core end must be elimination of the racial wealth gap within a decade. Um, let me, uh, there's a question I think that's unpacking a bit the comments you made earlier about uh, eligibility. Uh, and they would like for you to explain a bit more about the methodology for determining eligibility, particularly given the type of record keeping involved in centuries past. So this is the genealogy Geo is it issue? Ge question about genealogy? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, the eligibility issue. You know, just a little so bit more about the methodology you'd use. So, um, you, know, you know, genealogists typically, you know, either, you know, they, either they work f uh, forwards or backwards, right? You sort of start with the individual uh, and collect as much information as you can from them as possible, uh, from local census records, uh, sometimes from, uh, you know, the, the records of slaveholders themselves, some of whom were quite meticulous. Uh, you know, we came across recently um, a slaveholder in South Carolina who listed uh, the 694 black people that he owned by name in his will. Um, now that's, that's a rare case, but you know, such cases do exist. Um, you know, I think because you know, Americans just generally have been much more interested in trying to learn about their history. More resources are available all the time online. Um, you know, uh, state archival collections um, have staff who can assist, you know, individuals with this discovery. Um, there are some states actually that had slave schedules, and in some cases, those enslaved persons were named. Um, it's not a trivial exercise, but it is not a, uh, an impossible one. Yeah, yeah and I think um, the, the expertise that has been developed among black genealogists or genealogists who work on black ancestry is such that, uh, uh, that this is something that would be a challenge, but it would not be an impossible challenge by any means. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, the place where you live had just passed a, uh, an ordinance or a declaration a or a proclamation yeah, uh, in your city. And I don't know whether you live in Asheville or, or This is not. Durham, Durham, okay. North Carolina. All right. Then the question then is valid, which is, can you comment on Asheville reparation program passed last month? So our understanding of the Asheville um, uh, initiative is that basically the city is 
making a declaration that it will do what it should have done all along, which is to include, I don't even know that they specify, um, you know, the uh, programs for black uh, residents or black businesses, but minority yeah, they use the term minority. businesses. Um, so, you know, when, with the Malcolm X analogy, you know, this is, you know, beginning to look at the harms, but not at all correcting all of the, you know, the hundred plus years of um, exclusion in these these city programs and city set asides that the city of Asheville has practiced. So this is a case where, um, you know, we would not use the term reparations, but uh, you know, some sort of transformational justice or um, you know, doing what you should have done in the first place program. Um, but you know, certainly, I think on the ground, uh, Asheville's program will be one of goodwill. Um, but it's not reparations. It's not going to alter the wealth gap of the black citizens, uh, you know, in, you know, in that city. Well, um, and it's impossible for municipal and state governments to, to eliminate to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Uh, if you took all of their budgets combined, it would amount to about three point one trillion dollars. And as we've said. What's required to erase the racial wealth differential in full is somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 12 trillion dollars. So it's it's not even feasible for those levels of government to achieve the aim of eliminating racial wealth differences. Uh, but then also there's the question of who is the culpable party? And so from our perspective, it's the federal government because the federal government is responsible for the legal and authority framework that sanctioned these atrocities over the course of the period from the formation of the Republic in 1776 to the present moment. And so uh, that's who should pay and, uh, and that's who we should, we should pr promote as, as, uh, as responsible for, for making the payment. Um, if I were to try and simplistically characterize uh, what I am hearing, and let me try and put it also in a, a historical context. Uh, at the end of the Civil War, um, you the when I say you, the body politic, the U.S. government, uh, recognized that you were setting free a group of now citizens who have been deprived of education, deprived of their liberty, were incapable of functioning in the society as they knew it then. And so they set up a structure called Reconstruction. Uh, and this, and it had in it, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, the 40 acre uh, land distribution, but there were a lot of other things uh, involved in terms of setting up uh, banking institutions, educational institutions and things of that nature. Uh, and then the rug was pulled out from under it by uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, who you characterize, I think you characterize as the worst president. You might get some debate on that today, uh, but uh, we will move <laughs> on uh, from that. Uh, but what if the answer is do what you said you were going to do, finish the job you said you, that you started in 1865, adjusted for the time value uh, of money. Yeah, so in chapter 13, we actually yeah. talk about uh, what the present value would be of 40 acres, acres that uh, it had it been provided. And we come up with a range of estimates between four to six trillion dollars. Uh, but there's a cumulative effect over time of having denied right. black Americans those land grants and having simultaneously provided large numbers of white families with even larger land grants. And so that's why we focus on what we view as the product of the, those cumulative effects, the racial wealth gap, uh, which yields a slightly higher uh, total bill for reparations. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's interesting, you, it's interesting you that like you mentioned share. this. There's a quotation that we include uh, in From Here to Equality that, that captures uh, the same you know, conundrum. Uh, this is um, from Ida B. Wells, the you know the writer, uh, activist. Um, she sh and and she says in the 1893, uh, the Civil War of 1861 to 65 ended slavery. It left us free, 
but it also left us homeless, penniless, ignorant, nameless, and friendless. Russia's liberated serf was given three acres of land and agricultural implements with which to begin his career of liberty and independence. But to us, no foot of land nor implement was given. We were turned loose to starvation, destitution, and death. So desperate was our condition that some of our statesmen declared it was useless to try to save us by legislation as we were doomed to extinction. So, I mean, I think there are many who would hold fast. You know, they're, 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 you know, they're still hoping that Ida B. Wells' uh, statement is true. But, um, you know, our presence here, uh, you know, definitely is contrary to that. And we think these are issues that are still important, more important now than ever. Um, and that this is a time to address, this is the time to address these promises. The, I think uh, in many ways, this all gets back to the average American's ignorance of history. Yeah. Uh, and not only in history, of course, is his story. And it's always told by the victors, except in the case of the Civil War, uh, when it was told by the losers. Uh, but uh, what we see um, in the teaching of history itself is almost runs counter to what you're trying to accomplish. It's possible now to get a college degree without taking a history course. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, you know, a lot of this gets solved when you understand your past, when you own your past. Uh, but uh, not only were you not being taught your past or you didn't learn it, now there are, are movements that not even talk about uh, right. the past. And so, you know, the, the last uh, one of the this is, isn't exactly a question, uh, but a statement by one of the questioners that came in that says, white Americans really needed to study black history, to know the horrible laws and rules that impacted the lives of blacks uh, to the present day. Informed whites would support reparations. How can all whites become informed? Is, can there be a mass information campaign? Does your commission uh, start to deal with this? So we would say, you know, there, there, there is American history. You know, this is our history. We made, we made this world together. And, um, you know, it's not that the information is not, it isn't there. It is there. Uh, it's, we're just very selective about, you know, what we, what we teach. Um, you know, we learned that, um, you know, that there were very focused, systematic efforts to alter the country's understanding of what the war was about, the Civil War was about, um, you know, that it was not about, uh, you know, uh, continuing a way of life that was based on on slavery, uh, but states' rights, uh, the aggression of the North, uh, or tariffs. Um, but in fact, in the moment, Americans knew exactly what the war was about. I, I wanted to read just really briefly a bit from. Um, from, uh, from Here to Equality, this is um, our, our section on radicals and rebels. Um, immediately after the surrender, when the ex-Confederates had been brought down by their defeat, there was, a propitious, uh, there was a propitious moment. So from fall 1865 to early 1866, many Americans, blacks and whites, Northerners and Southerners, expected significant penalties to be imposed on the states formerly in rebellion as a condition for their readmission to the Union. When Whitelaw Reed traveled along the Atlantic coast and spoke with a cross-section of residents, including shopkeepers, black artisans, farmers, and planters, Freedmen's Bureau agents and officers, and freedmen in urban and rural areas, and toured several cotton plantations, he observed, quote, it was manifest that if restoration of civil authority depended on Negro suffrage, it would be accepted. Scherz's report to Johnson, President Johnson, concluded, when the news of Lee's and Johnson, uh, Joseph Johnston's surrenders burst upon the South, the Southern country, the general consternation was extreme. The public mind was so despondent that if readmission at some future time, under whatever conditions had been promised, it would have been looked upon as a favor. Here was the ideal moment to push forward for the full array of black rights. 
But when Johnson opened the door for North Carolina to reorganize its state government without making provisions for blacks' political rights, and followed that with pardons and paroles for, quote, prominent wealthy insurgents, end quote, ex-Confederate Confederate leaders, generals, and diplomats, Southerners understood, quote, the president was willing to concede to them more power than they had hoped, end quote. Almost immediately after Johnson's proclamation was announced, white Southerners' resistance to black voting and civil liberties began to harden. General John W. Sprague wrote of the mood he observed in Little Rock, Arkansas, those who had returned from the rebel armies were most quiet and orderly, but it is not so now. Increasingly, Southern whites were observed treating freedmen with, quote, cruelty and callousness. Callousness. So we know that um, the groups like the Daughters of the American Republic and the United Daughters of the Confederacy um, targeted textbooks, textbook writers whose narratives did not agree with the message that they wanted, uh, you know, young people to receive. Um, you know, they they hired their own writers. In some cases, they wrote history textbooks, and some of those textbooks were in place for 70, 80 years. I mean, we have you know many many states that simply you know neglected their duties and did not you know provide for up to date uh, you know any any new uh, textbooks being published. But um, you know, we talk about sort of dismemory, this active forgetting uh, that we have been um, you know this country has just been you know kind of brainwashed. You know, when you see these Confederate monuments, for example, there's no way to imagine that these are memorials to individuals who lost the war, that these are monuments to traitors to the Republic, to rebels, because they, they look grand and glorious. Um, you know, so these are things that you have to, want, you have to question, well, why, did, why was this even allowed to happen in the first place? Um, I think today we're in a moment where many people, black and white, are feeling something has to happen. Like you said, people are feeling we have to do something. Um, but, you know, will we let this moment pass just as the moment passed, you know, after the Civil War? You know, people are feeling now is the time we must do something. There's all this evidence. There's so many reasons to do differently. Will we seize the moment? Will we seize the day and work together to make a dramatic change and fulfill the promise of, you know, liberty and citizenship for, you know, black American descendants of slavery? Thank you. I think because of the time, that's going to be a great ending statement. Let me, uh, on behalf of the African American Heritage House, thank Ms. Kirsten Mullen and Dr. William Darity uh, for the time they spent with us, for the insights uh, that they've shared with us. Remember, the name of the book is From Here uh, to Equality, the University of North Carolina uh, Press, and I'm sure the bookstore here at Chautauqua uh, has it uh, as well. Uh, next week is our final week. Uh, in the year of the census, uh, certainly demography is destiny, and we're going to have a talk by Dr. James Johnson from the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, he's going to address a number of demographic issues in a certainly novel uh, and interesting manner, and I would invite all of our viewers uh, to, to stay tuned uh, next week for yet one more capstone uh, and interesting talk. So again, uh, Ms. Mullen, Dr. Darity, thank you for your many contributions and uh, good luck on your book. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna sell a lot after today's uh, discussion. I appreciate your being with us. Thank you so much for inviting thank us. Thank you for having us. CHQ Assembly is made possible through the collaboration and innovation of Chautauqua Institution's full-time and part-time staff, seasonal staff, and many volunteers, as well as participants like you, whose engagement, gifts, and subscriptions sustain our mission.